Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Sarah, Sarah Doken Morgan. Welcome to Thriving Adoptees. Looking forward to our conversation today, Sarah. Thank you. Me too. Thanks yeah. for having me. So Sarah and I connected listeners uh, towards the end, uh, yeah, the middle of last year, so about six months or so ago. Um, and one of the reasons that we've held back on the, uh, on the, uh, recording the conversation uh, they're doing the interviews because she wanted to make sure that it, it it coincided with the launch of her book. So, as always, um, check out the show notes uh, of the podcast to, for connections to to the guest on social, and I put links in 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 the books to there as well. So, um, so twenty twenty four, we're focusing on for as as long as I can figure, as far as I can figure going forward, until I have a better idea, I guess, um, we're focusing on on healing. And so, so Sarah, I wanted to start by asking, um, what does healing mean to you? I guess when I think of healing, I think of it in terms of a cognitive component. So having really thought about the things that have perhaps caused you pain or hindered you in the past. So that cognitive component, I also think of it as an emotional component, being able to feel the emotions that you feel, uh, not deny those emotions, but also on an emotional and cognitive level, trusting that those emotions will pass and that all of the emotions that we experience are fleeting to some extent. And so I think that healing relationally, so I guess I've talked about cognitively and emotionally and relationally, that healing also means that you're not perpetuating pain to other people and that you're able to pursue relationships and perhaps career goals or personal goals or whatever it might be that you have and that your pain and trauma are not getting in the way of those things, but actually are a piece of your story so that you can synthesize those things. So that's kind of a long answer. But I think really, if we think about healing, it involves this ability to kind of do what you need to do. And maybe part of that process is staying in bed all day or eating ice cream all day. And that's your path in the moment. But then thinking, well, that's what I'm going to do today and maybe tomorrow or whatever it might be. But then really thinking about what types of relationships do I want to have or what types of personal goals. And that might be just something like going on a walk every day or whatever it might be that you have that you can pursue or walk toward in some ways those goals. Yeah. So I think it's complicated. So I think in some ways that healing is um a very lifelong process and I think it can look different on different days really yeah yeah I I love the breadth uh of of your uh definition um and I love this the the, the clarity and the uh, the the degree that you've summed it up very succinctly uh, mm-hmm. and 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 in a, in a in a measured way as probably uh, befits you because you're a you're a professor aren't you you're a professor mm-hmm. of communication studies so you've you, you've got that clarity and, and there's a lot there's a logic kind of that that sent out but we but and we're and we're not we're saying that it's not just logic though it's not just that cognitive stuff it's it, it's the emotional stuff as well and it's not just us on our own it, it's about uh, healing in um, re- relationship. And the other thing that came across was the uh, the other word that sprung to, to mind was the word of grace, right? Mm-hmm. So it's grace for ourselves if if on one day it looks like staying in bed 
it is what we want to do or that's all we, we're able to do on that day, then we, we do that and we do that with grace rather than beating ourselves up about the fact that we're having a, that we're having a, a, a bad day. Yeah. Yes, I think so. And just saying, this is where I'm at in the moment and that's okay. Yeah. And then not putting a timeline on it. I recall when I, my mom died in 2003, my adoptive mom. And I recall sitting in my therapist's office at the time. And she said, well, you should just try to sit with the emotions, you know, sit with the sadness, sit with the grief. And I said, okay, fine. How long? And that was sort of the point was that there is not really a clear timeline, but that you learn to kind of trust yourself and trust the process, which I guess is kind of a cliche, but to trust in your own resilience and also to have people in your life that can support you and care for you. And they say, maybe it's day 21 and you haven't gotten out of your pajamas. Let's go for a walk. You know, it, I don't think that healing is something that can be done in a solitary manner. And I also heard um, a metaphor once that, you know, scars are really beautiful because they say that healing has occurred. And so that we can embrace those scars and to say that that's part of my story. And so I think healing also involves an honesty about the wounds that we've maybe, uh, you know, experienced in the past. So, yeah, I think that's, I think that's the cognitive part really. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's interesting. You mentioned that um, the, the loss of your, uh, your, your mom, your adopted mom back um, 20, yeah, 21 years ago now, um, because I, 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 there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of people are, are, are saying to me that that grief is perhaps one of the most similar events. So if we're describing if we're describing the loss of our of our birth mother, we're describing relinquishment trauma to a uh, somebody that hasn't that isn't in, involved in adoption, then equating it or or, or drawing a similarity between relinquishment trauma and and grief makes it kind of more understandable for them and it also makes it more understandable for for us because we are you know most of the, this relinquishment trauma is pre-verbal so we don't have we don't have words for it and it's pre kind of to use your word cognitive is pre-cognitive memory so we don't have a memory of it in our conscious mind. We only, if there is a memory, it's only in in, in our subconscious, and it and it's it's stored in the in the body. That's when when people say the body keeps the score. I think they're talking about uh, that book by what's it, Bessel van der Kolk. He, he's he's talking about subconscious trauma. Uh, and and therefore, um, yeah, we're we feel it in in the moment if it's still there. It we we feel it in like so. I I, I sometimes get it when um, I get a feeling of like a feeling in the pit of my stomach when somebody's going to let me down or somebody's backing away from me or something has triggered a uh, like a rejection thing within me or an abandonment thing within me uh, and it, in that sense we're always coming out of the fog because mm -hmm. we're we are those bodily reminders are coming up to, yeah. to 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 point to subconscious 
trauma. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that have you heard about this sort of stuff? Is this making sense? Yeah. You might you might lend a better clarity to me than this. No, no. And I'm certainly not an expert in trauma, you know, or a psychologist or anything like that. Uh, I will say that I think that, you know, part of making sense of our story as adoptees, and I think part of, you know, healing as you as you mentioned, is this ability to kind of locate our reactions in a larger story and to say like, oh, you know, I'm feeling it in my body or I'm having this emotional reaction to this thing that maybe seems bigger than the stimulus itself and, or maybe doesn't make sense. And then to say, oh, okay, that that makes sense because of what I experienced as an adoptee. I think I'll give you an example. When I was young, my parents' bedroom was at the end of the hall, my adoptive parents, and my bedroom was next to their bedroom. And so you had to walk by my bedroom to get out of the house. But every night before we would go on a family trip, the night before a family trip, you know, if we were just going to my grandparents' house or whatever, I would set my blankets um, and my pillow on the floor outside of their room because I wanted to make sure that they wouldn't forget me. And so even though they would have had to walk by my room to leave the house and they, they assured me many times, like, we're not going to forget you. You know, there's no way that we would forget you. You know, now looking back, having studied adoption for a long time and, and just also knowing myself you know, I think, wow, that little girl wasn't thinking, oh, this is because I'm adopted and I was abandoned as a baby. But certainly that explanation makes sense of that pre-verbal abandonment that I experienced at four months old. So I think that part of that healing process is to, like I said, kind of trace back our reactions and our experiences and let them make sense in the context of adoption. And sometimes it is because, and I will say that sometimes it is because of adoption and sometimes maybe it's just because of personality or other identity pieces that we, you know, possess. So maybe it's, you know, due to mental illness that people experience, or maybe it's due to other you know, personalized experiences that people have had because being an adoptee is just one part of one's identity. It's a big part, but there are other things that shape who we are and who we become. Yeah. It, it, you, you talk, you use the word uh, making sense. It seems to me that a, a, a lot of stuff for me makes sense later. It, it mm -hmm. makes sense with with the... Uh, benefit of time mm -hmm. stuff, stuff makes sense uh, and, and as we e explore things and maybe that that's kind of proof of the ongoing nature that you uh, of the of the healing stuff of the, of the think, healing process yeah I think so and I think that you know maybe something is going to happen today that I'll have to make sense of 10 years from now so I definitely think it's ongoing. I think part of getting older, hopefully, maybe this is aspirational, is that that time delay is a little bit shorter, that it doesn't take me, you know, 10 or 20 okay. years to make sense of things, but it still might make sense. It still might take me a long time to heal still, you yeah. know? So I guess there's that cognitive and the emotional part that sometimes are linked, but also can be separate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That um, sometimes somebody might say, oh, well, this, this thing that I'm experiencing right now is going to make me stronger and it's making me more grateful, but you know, it sure sucks, you know, and I'm mad and I'm sad. And so those yeah. different pieces, I guess. And that takes you back to that, uh, that point that you mentioned about this two shall pass. So mm. in, in the moment, it's, Clearly, that 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 wisdom doesn't always come to us, but hopefully, that comes to us faster and and more of the time with 
with age. And I'm just um, just kind of thinking about the the grief topic again. And obviously, from from your name, people wouldn't know that you're a, a transnational a Korean right. adoptee, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just thinking about the uh, what grief means. Um, what grief means from that perspective, from the transnational or international adoption or transracial adoption, all people use those different terms. Mm -hmm. But I think we are, we've covered the identity piece a lot on the podcast with transracial adoptees. In terms of the grief piece, what does 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 that seem significant to you? How does that look? Yeah, I think for me, in terms of the grief that I've experienced as somebody who has both met my met and reunited and developed a loving relationship with my Korean birth family, and also somebody who has lived in Korea, my birth country, for two years from 2016 to 2018, I think the grief has been more evident in some ways, the closer in proximity, both you know physically, but also emotionally that I've been to Korea and with my birth family so that as I grow more emotionally close to my birth family, there's so much I wish that I could express. And there's so much I wish that I could understand based on their, their lifetime of being in family with each other. So that brings up grief for me and then also there are cultural things you know when we think about culture and I kind of mentioned this in the book people think of really superficial things like oh if you're going to Korea you know you should give this type of gift or they're going to expect you to eat kimchi or you should take off your shoes when you go in a house people think of cultural difference on that really kind of cursory level but a lot of cultural differences deal with how are people supposed to be or what does it mean to be in a relationship with other people so for example in korea you your identity is so much based on age and so you really you can be friendly with people who are older than you but you can't really be friends friends with people who are older than you the same way that you could in the us because there's that hierarchical assumption in relationships. And so those deep cultural things I'll never really fully understand, even if I speak Korean. And even if I learn Korean, I'll never be able to speak it with the ability of nuance that I can speak English. <laughs> and so I think that when I think about grief, I think about losing those things. And that does and maybe probably always will make me feel sad because yeah. that's a loss. Um, and at the same time, it doesn't stop me from continuing to learn more about Korea or trying to understand more about Korea and doesn't keep me from, you know, continuing to be in reunion with my Korean family. But it's it is this kind of push pull of like um, fondness, you know, toward Korea and then sadness. And so I tell people whenever I'm going to Korea, and I've been quite a few times over the years, I have this dual feeling of excitement on one hand, like oh, I'm so excited to go back to Korea, and I can't wait to do these things and see my family and do those things. And then on the other hand, I always have this sense too of like oh this is a bad idea I don't think I should go to Korea and I think it's because it brings up that grief but I still go and sure there are moments of sadness while I'm there but I want to be able to go and I want to continue learning and so I think that for me it's been the acceptance of those two things coexisting you know this this love and fondness for korea and this deep love for my korean family but also knowing that that comes with 
sometimes just sadness for lack of a better word. Yeah. And it's yeah. kind of, it's kind of ca- counterintuitive though, isn't it? The fact that the the you you think the 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 more time you spent there, or sorry, I would. I would think I I I think the more time that you spent there, the the less the grief would be. But it, it's mm-hmm. the it's been the opposite way round. It just goes to show how I don't know. Were, were, were you? Did you have any expectations on that? Did you expect that to happen? Did you expect the opposite? Yeah, I think I. Question? Yeah, uh, I think I expected. I think I. I think I didn't even know what to expect. Yeah. yeah. I think that I, whenever I was younger. And I would say, oh, I want to learn Korean someday. I had this sense that there would be an end point, kind of, that you would learn Korean, you know, and it's not anything that has an end point. Even people who, um, I know someone um, who has said, you know, they have been graded as fluent in Korean, but they still say, I'm still learning Korean, or I still feel like there are things that I want to express in Korean that I still can't, can't express. And so I think that has been, that was surprising to me that once I started taking Korean class, you know, just like anything you see from the outside and you think, oh, that's not going to be too hard. You know, I'm a, I'm a good student and I'm good with words, so I'll probably be able to learn it. And um, it was definitely, you know, challenging. And then I looked up, um, I came across a statistic from the U.S. Department of State where they rank the languages from, you know, most, you know, easiest to hardest to learn for English speakers. And Korean is rated as, you know, with the highest difficulty level, Korean and Chinese for English speakers to learn. And so that was actually real, really reassuring for me to be like, oh, it's not just me. But then even if I were to learn it, there's still not any end point. So I think that, yeah, learning it made me realize how difficult it would be. And then I think, I think if people go to their birth country for a limited amount of time, like a vacation or, or something like that, it's going to bring up challenging feelings, but when you spend an extended amount of time in a country, those cultural differences become more evident, I think, as you see how people move through the world and experience relationships and what's important to them and things like that. I think that as I gained more knowledge of that, from living in Korea, then it made it more clear to me that that's not necessarily how I see the world. And at the same time, I've been really lucky that my birth family has been and continues to be really uh, accepting of me. And that's brought tremendous healing that I didn't know that I needed also. Okay. Interesting that you didn't know you needed. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, like a lot of Korean adoptees, I was always told, and it's on my paperwork too, that your birth parents are unknown. And so I never thought even growing up about searching because my adoptive parents said, your documents say that you are found on the doorstep of the police station with um, a note pinned to your clothing that said your name and your birth date. And so I just assumed that that was the final word. And so I never even really thought about searching at all. And of course, this is all pre-internet. So there weren't, you know, and there weren't documentaries about adoptees in Korea finding their birth families and things like that. So it seemed just like an impossibility. And so I never really thought about searching. And by the way, this is a story that a lot of Korean adoptees will tell, which is that they're their birth parents, or excuse me, their adoptive parents were told the exact same thing, the same narrative when actually their birth parents were known or their birth families were known. And so um, 
So my birth family, my Korean birth family found me when I was 25. And it took me a few years um, to meet them. We exchanged a couple letters. But then when I met them, and then the more I got to know them, I just felt something inside of me click or re relax in a way that I didn't expect. Yeah. And that that also took time too, because the first, you know, the first time I met them, it was really overwhelming. But as we've developed a relationship, I just feel um I guess a sense that I belong yeah, with them and not that I shouldn't, well, that's, you know, that's debatable. Not that, not that my life now is terrible or anything like that, but just, I have a sense of belonging with them that is very visceral, I guess. Yeah. Do you, do you remember feeling that visceral feeling for the first time? I think there are a couple moments. I think the first one was that I have been told or had been told, you know, in multiple spaces in my life that um, you don't look Korean. And so, you know, they'd say, oh, you don't really have a Korean face or, you know, you don't really look Korean. And so I didn't ever feel like even if I saw other Korean people, which was very few and far between growing up, that I didn't, I almost felt like I didn't physically exist in a weird way. And so when I met my brother, one of my brothers for the first time, it was like looking in a mirror and I, you know, same shoulders, same legs, same smile, everything is so similar you know it's not one of those situations where you know sometimes you'll see two people and they'll be they look alike and they'll both be like oh we don't really look like each other they don't see it but we both see it and even we went to a market one day and a lady looked at us and said uh you two have the same face and so we look strikingly similar and that was a moment where I felt like, oh, I, I exist, I belong. And also, I like, I like how he looks. And so then that gives me, you know, I like his smile, I like his face. And it sounds funny, but then that makes me feel more love for how I look, you know? Um, and not like I'm, you know, um, spending hours doing selfies or looking in the mirror constantly, yeah. but it just gave, allowed me to see myself as inherently connected to somebody I like a whole lot and I love. And that was very healing. Um, you know, and the other thing that I think was helpful is that when we lived in Korea for two years, we were able to see my family on a really regular basis, on a more casual basis. And I think that for international adoptees, transnational adoptees, if they go back to their home country and see their birth family, it's kind of a big deal, which makes it more overwhelming. And for me to be able to see them, you know, for dinner or for lunch or for half an hour here, I think that also gave me a sense of family with them because it was casual, kind of like it is here in a lot of ways when you see family it's not a big deal it's um more casual and comfortable so i think that was extremely helpful as well yeah well, i've i've heard that um that idea of i've heard people say another i can't remember who it was somebody fairly recently said to me i didn't feel that i physically existed until mm -hmm. um, until you had this uh genetic mirroring i think is mm -hmm. was a, one of the, the terms that people use for it um, and some things just popped up for for me in terms of a uh, a similar kind of a situation, and yet completely different. 
So it was, so, it was, and I don't, I don't know whether it was this is true or not, but if it, it's a pretty good legend, even if it isn't true, right? Um, it was something to do with uh, native, uh, uh, native um, Americans or South Americans, I think it was, seeing, uh, not seeing the ship, not sh seeing the ships of mm -hmm. the the invaders or adventurers, whatever you want to call them, the people, the the the, the, the explorers from the West, colonizers, yes, yeah, the mm -hmm. colonizers, yeah, whatever. But they they couldn't see, they they couldn't see the ships because they had no um, imprint in their brain no concept of a ship mm -hmm. and for some reason that feels kind of similar but completely different I don't know whether mm -hmm. yeah I think that there is this idea of like if I can't see something does it exist or if I you know I think um, Thomas Park Clement who's a uh, one of the older generations of Korean adoptees for a while, his username on early internet things was um, alien, you know? And I think that on a lot of, in a lot of ways, I felt like an alien until I met my birth family because I didn't see, I saw other Korean adoptees, but as a Korean adoptee, you're kind of, you feel self-conscious enough as it is and you're trying to blend in. And so for me, I saw other Korean adoptees so rarely and other Asians so rarely that I would almost, that I would actively avoid them because it made, I felt like it was going to make me stand out or attract questions like, oh, is that your sister? Or, you know, are you dating? You know, if it was a boy. And so to see someone who, really looks like me and to see people who are genetically linked toward me that was extremely healing yeah. yeah and then to and then to further build a relationship with them and realize that we like each other and that we have fun together and that that is something that I couldn't have even hoped for you know because you meet you meet people who have grown up with entirely different circumstances than you have and who may not share, you know, your similar values or humor or things like that. That's something that I think makes people very trepidatious when it comes to reuniting. But for me, I not only look like them, but I really enjoy them and vice versa. And that has been a huge gift yeah. and I think it's made me feel very fortunate I'm, I'm getting the sense that this people stuff is by far and the family stuff that that's the far by far the most profound part of of your healing I mean you couldn't you, you couldn't you can't break down a healing in like a pie chart so that it's into mm -hmm. oh, right well it's 10 percent emotional 15 percent mm -hmm. cognitive and 70 you, you can't yeah. do that clearly but i'm getting the sense that the 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 in-person the relationship stuff is by far the most profound part of the healing is that would you agree with that yeah for me it's been very helpful and i mean it, like if i think about the making sense the cognitive piece or the emotional piece and learning to sit with the emotions it's all types of relationships. It's not just my birth family. And so for adoptees who decide they don't want to search or for adoptees who search and don't find family or for adoptees who reunite and they don't get along with their birth family, I don't think birth family is necessary for adoptees to heal and thrive like your podcast um, name. I think it's, but I do think you know, having support for me, um, having friends who listen and help and care and ask questions who make me laugh. Um, for me also having 
my biological children has been extremely healing in, a, in many ways. Um, and then my partner, uh, my husband has also brought a lot of healing and just steadiness when it comes to exploring birth family stuff because it's very uncertain and scary. And so to have somebody who I knew would always be on my team was helpful as well. And then therapy, you know, um, so all of those things. And then other things that are like yoga and exercise and music and being outdoors and so things like that. Yeah, but but people and relationships, and that's what I study, right, is relationships definitely at the center. Yeah. Just I, I, I would say that I, I haven't been able to reunite with my birth mother uh, and my birth father. That's a different uh, kettle of fish altogether. But um, I, I would say from my perspective that I, 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 something came up for me, right, listening to you. And I've never, uh, I've, I've never heard the term before, but I've just made it up, right? It's called healing envy, right? Mm. <laughs> um, but I don't feel that, I, you know, that, that was, I, I don't feel it is, I don't feel it is necessary or it has been necessary for me. I don't think, oh, well, I can never heal because my birth mother died before I started looking for her. Mm -hmm. um uh, when i say to people that my birth mother i i found out that my birth mother had died they say oh that must have been terrible and i and i say well yeah it wasn't it it wasn't great but i'd had my most significant healing moment probably six months before that um when i had actually felt her love for me in a letter that she wrote to an adoption social worker that she never even knew that I would I would see mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she'd written it a month after I was born mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and I I felt a I felt uh, I felt her love for me and I actually felt connected with her i felt that i i felt a, a visceral you know use use the visceral I, I i felt a visceral connection between us i i thought i felt that me and her were one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, yeah that's wonderful it, it was uh it, it as the tears ran down my face reading mm -hmm. this letter mm -hmm. I, I i felt oneness perhaps in a in a in a spiritual way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um clearly not a physical way mm -hmm. yeah and i think and i think that sometimes you know, whether it's through writing or story or other things like that, that messages can kind of transcend space and time like that letter in some ways, yeah. or, you know, my birth mother actually died in 2019 and she didn't, I did get to meet her and spend time with her, but I almost feel like we can communicate better now that, and this is just an individual spiritual yes. belief, but that now that because she is spirit and not body, that she's kind of with me all the time and that she can understand me now that we're not bound by language in a way that maybe she wasn't able to when she was alive. So I call on her more now that she has died and i think that in that way i feel like i'm still in relationship with her yeah 
I'm kind of speechless at that. Because <laughs> we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm getting goosebumps now. <laughs> I mean, down my round down my arm because uh I, I believe that there's part of us, you know, I I I'm into that. There's that spiritual part of us hasn't been wounded in the, in the mm -hmm. and if it hasn't been wounded then it doesn't need to doesn't need to heal mm -hmm. right yeah and that it like i said kind of transcends space and time so that we can always access that love somehow if we believe that it's there yeah. yeah. So I, I think for me, that's another component in some ways is, you know, I said, you know, cognitive, emotional, relational, but I think also a spiritual component has been helpful too. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't hear much about that. Mm -hmm. It tends to be the psychological that dominates. Yeah. I think, well, and I think, you know, people, I think religion has such a negative connotation in many, in many Western liberal circles. Um, and I don't know that it needs to be, you know, I, I know that it doesn't need to be a specific religion or a specific type of practice. But for me, it's been helpful to feel like I can call upon, you know, my adoptive mother who died in 2003, my adoptive dad who died in 2008, and then my birth mom who died in 2019 to feel like they are with me and that they understand everything and maybe everything in a way that they weren't under able to understand in a way when they were on, <laughs> on this planet, you know. So I think in a cool way, I was able to um, experience in Korea on New Year's and also on Chuseok, uh, which is the Fall Harvest Festival, people, I went to my grandparents' graves with my siblings, and you bring fruit and maybe wine and you do bowing and things like that. But there's so much more, you know, in Korean cultures and a lot of Eastern cultures, this idea that you honor the ancestors and that that's a physical thing that you do. I think in the U S especially we lack that reverence for the past in a lot of ways. And so I don't ever go visit my parents' graves. It's kind of far from where we live. Um, but when I do, it feels like this cold, you know, graveyard environment, but in, but when my Korean mom died, I, I laid, I lit some candles and I put a picture of her on the table and I put some fruit around it. And just this idea, that ritual of pausing to remember and honoring them because I wouldn't be who I am without, without her, I think is a really tangible kind of beautiful thing that yeah. was helpful. Mm -hmm. I I heard somewhere a couple of days ago, I think it was, that yoga, you mentioned yoga, that mm -hmm. yoga means union. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is that mm -hmm. right? You, yep, union or to yoke together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, d does that have any significance? Yeah, for, this for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do yoga. I'm actually training to become a yoga teacher currently. But I think that for me, it's been helpful in part, part of yoga is remembering that, you know, there's just this breath, you know, and we inhale and we exhale and that then the interconnectedness between humans and nature, uh, principles such as like, you know, um, nonviolence and truthfulness and non-grasping all of those things I think 
have been helpful in terms of any context where things are difficult, right? And that you can direct nonviolence. I think sometimes we're we're kind of violent toward ourselves when we say, oh, I, you know, I should be in a different place on my adoptive identity journey, or I shouldn't be feeling this way, but rather to say, hey, this is what's happening in the moment. Let me tune into my body. Let me continue to breathe. Let me notice how I'm connected to nature. I think it's it can be a really powerful spiritual practice in a lot of ways. Do you think that, um, to use your word, violence to ourselves, do you think that that hinders our healing? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think so. I think that a lot of people, you know, not just adoptees, but that we engage in a lot of violence toward ourselves. And I'm not speaking of physical violence, although, you know, some people struggle with that as well, but just this sort of constant self-critique, constant monitoring, whether it's where we're at, you know, emotionally, whether it's where we're at professionally, whether it's where we're at physically, as opposed to accepting what is in the moment and moving moving with gentleness and seeing it all as part of the human experience as opposed to something inherently wrong with ourselves. Yeah. And I think as an adopted person, you can easily grow up feeling isolated as an adoptee, um, feeling that nobody else maybe or not very many people really understand your experiences. But, you know, yoga and many religions teach us that to be in community is a really important, powerful thing. Yeah. Does anything else come to mind in terms of what's hit, what what's hin what hinders your uh, healing or, or what hinders our healing? Yeah, I think I think a lot of it is that self critique, you know that I've mentioned before. I think that especially, and my students have said this too, but especially with things like social media, you know, you feel like there's a right way to grieve or there's a right way to be an adoptee. You know, people have said, I've heard people say, you know, as I feel like I should be more, you know, socially conscious as an adopted person, or I feel like I should maybe, I think some people will say like, oh, I feel like I should want to search, but I don't, or I feel like I should, you know, speak Korean and I don't, or I feel like I should have been to Korea and I haven't. And I think that in a lot of ways, that comparison and this idea that there's a right way to be anything and it could be with regard to adoptive identity, but it could be with regard to, you know, femininity or masculinity, right? That there's a right way to be a woman and there's a right way to be a man. And all of these things are intersecting too. But I think that self-critique is really adds another layer of suffering onto what is already and can be a challenging experience, you know? Yeah. It's like an inner conflict, kind of. Mm, a conflict yeah. like, I, I am like this, but I should be like that. Mm -hmm, yeah. I am and, like and, this, but so-and-so is like that. Mm -hmm, yeah, that, that, that ever-moving measuring stick, you know, that if you're judging yourself by what other people are doing or what you see people doing, especially with regard to, you know, public image, as opposed to being directed by your inner, your inner voice and what you want to do, then I think that can cause challenges. I think the other thing that can be really challenging with regard to healing too, though, that I just thought of is, um, you know, unhealthy relationships, right? 
And so I think that I heard this metaphor once that said, you know, sometimes you'll hear a song on the radio and you hear it repeatedly and you think that you like the song, but it's just because you've heard it over and over. And sometimes people do that with relationships that they have always had kind of maybe unhealthy, for lack of a clearer word, relationships. And so they always gravitate toward unhealthy relationships, not realizing that they don't like it or that it's not good for them. And so I think that having people in one's life who, and investing in relationships that are supportive and have healthy boundaries is very important. Um, and that when people have relationships that are characterized by, you know, unhealthy uh, communication or damaging or dismissive communication, then that's that can inhibit healing. But people are afraid sometimes to be alone. So they still gravitate toward those. Yeah. If you heard me clicking, if you heard me clicking, listeners, and Sarah, <laughs> Um, I was thinking about a quote that I'd heard um, and it ties together something that Sarah's talking about now and something I said earlier on about. Um, so this this is a quote, I, and I found it fairly quickly, by, by Jung. And it, it, it goes like this. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Mm -hmm. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. And that was the quote that came to my mind there in terms of being stuck in a rut mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the uh, the repetition of patterns and the repetition mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and and it, it why we do the same things over and over again mm -hmm. it's because there's something in our that's what Jung would say anyway that there's something in our um, and like you I'm not a, 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 a therapist or a psychiatrist um, yeah I did a year of psychology I thought this is you know I picked psychology it was one of the options in for my second year at university and I thought that I thought this is great. This will this will help me explain why people behave the way that <laughs> that they do, uh, and it did. Anyway, um, so I didn't stick with psychology, but that's what that's what Jung said. Yeah. So it, 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 there's some something subconscious going that's driving um, that, that's driving this repeat. Mm -hmm. um, I'm um, I'm conscious of time, and I just want to ask you: Is the we've covered so much here? Is there something that you'd like to share that I've not asked you about? Yeah, not that I can think of. I think a lot of it is all about people trusting themselves and then having other people around them who they can really trust and to know that everyone is on their own timeline and there's no final destination. I think those things are really important. Yeah. And that it's just ongoing forever, <laughs> which is, I think, the good news, but also um, I think that's good news because there's no race to a finish and if people are thinking about it then then they're on the path already i think that's great yeah and there's nowhere to get to right because mm -hmm. we're already there already mm -hmm. and we just move move to different pit stops or we just keep moving and yeah. it's it's all it's all okay it's all okay 
and and when we're moving you said i i like i loved what you said about something you said we're non-grasping mm, non-grasping yeah that was that's one of the um yamas of yoga is non-grasping that we don't we try not to attach to a specific outcome we try not to attach to a specific version of ourselves we try not to grasp to a certain view of reality that we're pretty fluid in how we see ourselves and the world and other people. And I think that's a really healthy orientation yeah. is that, you know, we can be in loving relationships, but we might find that, you know, the relationship shifts or the person changes and we say well that's natural because everybody's changing or we might say i never want to search that's fine but don't be too attached to that because you don't know how you might feel in five years or whatever you know whatever it might be that we try not to grasp too hard to certain yeah. ways of being because we're always changing yeah, and, and we can change our mind as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's that goes back to the fluidity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of I, so I've never done any yoga, but I, you know, when you think of yoga, you think about the stances. You don't think of well, I do. Sorry, when mm -hmm. I think of yoga, mm -hmm. I think of the stances, and mm -hmm. that's I don't I don't think of the 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 deeper stuff. So it's it's probably a little bit like. Um, you were saying about uh, the the depth mm -hmm. when people talk about you know career and and, and international adoption trans people people think people uh, uh, mention the superficial things rather than than, than the deeper stuff and I I guess I'm just thinking that's what I do when I think about yoga it's it's about that uh, depth yeah. Yeah. Well, and I don't want to do too much of a plug for yoga because it's not what this is about. But oh, no. I will say that the the poses, the asanas are a very are just one small component of yogic practice, okay. and that there's been movements to kind of shift the attention away from this view of yoga as beautiful women in yoga pants doing really difficult poses and more toward a more inclusive social justice based version of yoga that um, makes it more about people listening to their own bodies and is inclusive of all people yeah so and I think that type of yoga is going to be more healing than the type of yoga where you feel bad because you don't look perfect in yoga pants and you can't do a handstand so <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah um I I was thinking about the yoga as in the union so mm -hmm. I was thinking about you saying your um your your birth month and your uh, and your adoptive mum are always with you mm -hmm. and, and I was thinking about me and my birth mum being mm -hmm. as, as one mm -hmm. that was the visceral feeling I got when I was reading that letter from her yeah and um and coincidentally now it's this is after we after we close this conversation off this is this is the time i ring my mum every night mm. so check oh in. that's nice yeah and i like i like the idea sometimes i picture in my head my birth parents and my adoptive parents all holding hands and encircling me and that's another i think wow. at least a visualization of that you know, unity and that kind of yoking together. Yeah. Wow. Powerful. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Thanks, for Thanks Simon. Yes. Thank you. We'll speak to you all very soon. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye bye.